the diversity of pastel, the creativity of pastel, it's a broad subject, and as all of you know, it's a broad medium. So if I walk past, you have a painting in the show and I walk past it, it wasn't for any reason that I walked past it, it's just that they are limiting my time. Shirley knows me very well. And they used to come to the door and go like this and then grab me by the shoulder. But uh, again, do feel free to ask a question or a clarification and I just wanna hit some high points and get into that creative part. So before I do that though, a, li a little bit of what I want all of you to remember as painters is that we spend so much time focused on our techniques and process. And I'll allude to some of that because that's part of creatively what unfolds. If pastel hadn't been experimented with, played with, and tried in various ways, we wouldn't be here today doing what we're doing. But there's also the artistic content of what's there. And that crosses lines. I mean, pastel isn't beautiful. The painting isn't fabulous and beautiful and in a museum because it was done with pastel. It's because the artist also portrayed something. They put themselves and their soul into that piece. It's a piece of communication. It crosses borders. I mean, we have artists here that speak foreign languages. We see work that I can't communicate with the artist, but when we see that image, we feel a connection. And this is something that as human beings, we all share. So it cuts history, culture, socioeconomics, all that kind of stuff, that we can have that. And obviously the language barrier that I was alluding to. <laughs> so, I, and again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not passing over things for any reason, and I might pause a little longer somewhere. We'll see where the conversation goes. But I, fa I found this grouping really fascinating when, when you are here, because what you see, and it's become very popular again, I love art history. Um, I think there's so much to learn from it as we look to the future. You know, the new movements, no artist ever shows up and says, I wanna be an impressionist. We're gonna create impressionism or tonalism or romanticism. All the isms, as I've said, no artist says, I'm gonna be an ism. <laughs> what they notice is that I'm artists so start reflecting something. And those reflections can come from their cultural environment, historically what's happening, what we become aware of. And so what, what you see in this lovely piece around the corner here is really a very quiet, tonalist impression. Then we see a much bolder portrayal, and I love paintings too, we start to know that this isn't ancient, right? This painting, there's no sign of man, see? So getting back to the imagery, I used to avoid that in all of my paintings. I don't want buildings and, you know, damn it, there's power lines in this scene. Now, I'm intrigued by putting them in. And they're really starting to become nostalgic. Think about it, 50, 100 years from now, people are gonna look at that and go, wow, look at those power lines, weren't they beautiful? <laughs> <laughs> And so I think at times we, we live too much in the moment, even when we're painting, that we don't give ourselves that ability to get in tune, you know, to say, what is the purpose in what I'm doing? You know, am, am I recording this time? Am I being nostalgic in what I'm painting? You know, gorgeous, bold use of color. We know that pastel, it, this really in a way is our more modern attitude with pastel. And that's partly based in what the pigment industries started giving pastel us. Um, but I think at the same time, I brought this up in the president's forum just a little bit, that we've become, we've become funny as a family in getting upset about the term drawing or chalk. There's chalk in all your pastels, by the way. It's an inert product. We're not using chalk, but chalk is part of it. And then they talk about, well, I hate that pastel is a reference to things delicate and, and, and that kind of soft tonal quality. We say pastel shades. And they go, what's wrong with that? You know, If the work is beautiful, the work is beautiful. But now we know that pastel can stand toe to toe with the boldest acrylic paintings, oil paintings, and some, maybe even sometimes be more brilliant because of that. I'm really intrigued by this piece because we start to recognize what it is. 
I, I love mystery in paintings, so this gets back to this artist's voice, I think, is, is engaging us. My, one of my earliest mentors said, at the end of every painting, which kind of gave me a checklist when I was learning, she said, give, give them something. Involve them. Engage them. And give them a little mystery to solve. Because they'll make it their own story then. And I think this artist has really done this in this piece. In this in most exhibitions, I'd say even 10 years ago, it was rare to see more modern artists using um, pastel. That, and that has continued to grow. We see lots of expressions, and we'll see some as we walk around where artists um, utilize natural things, you know, flowers or even the landscape, and they'll interpret it in what I call a more modern, abstracted sense. But then you also, in these two pieces, I think you're really seeing something that speaks to that real abstract. You know, I go, what is it? I can look at it and I can begin to imagine, and that goes back to that comment that I said. You know, a lot of people go, I don't like abstract, I don't understand it. And I go, well, it's not meant to be understood in a defining what the object is sort of way. If I say a rose, we all have our memories of roses, but what's exciting about abstract, and you guys know me, I'm not an abstract modern painter, I'm a romantic impressionist, as the Chinese once said, and I said, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I'm not here to reinvent the wheel. But what I love in abstract is it takes us back to the core of design. And if there was, in a way, a secret in painting, in, in, in the most highly realistic paintings in this show, it's abstract. So it's not, it's not that we're an abstract artist, but we have to build that. So one of my legends we're so glad to have here, you know, is Dwayne Wakeham. And again, Jimmy Wright, many legends here and stuff. But Dwayne and I, in conversations at times, have talked about many things. Um, he knows where all the pastel bodies are buried. <laughs> but one of those comments was, we really do what abstract artists do. We start there and we build up. They take what's real and build away. So that, that excites me to see the number of, of those artists. Um, again, the modern placement within the landscape, beautiful, intriguing design. I, <laughs> this probably just speaks to my character. My mother knew this real well. I believe in laws, but breaking rules is fun. <laughs> so we all learn the rules when we're painting. Yeah, I've got to start somewhere. Right? And, that, and that's something even in writing, you know, a, a classic writer will say, um, Jack Kerouac, I once heard somebody say, I like what he was talking about, but you know he's a horrible writer because he breaks all the rules. <laughs> but is that really important, you know? So as artists, we lear learn these rules, like, you know, you don't take a square and divide it this way, you don't do this, but look what the artist pulled off. Counterpoint. See, there's that counterpoint balance within the design, and it works. So never forget in your own work. If it works, don't beat yourself up on how many rules you've broken to get there, because nobody, nobody cares when you fall in love with a painting. Uh, of course, Daniel Keyes, we're, we're really honored to have uh, had him come to the convention this time. He had just left the uh, Frida West. Uh, mentored in part of his life with uh, Richard Schmidt, the legend. Um, I, I heard Colette's wonderful gallery talk. I said, wow, you really set the benchmark here. Um, far more academic. I'm more the character, you know, hands <laughs> flying, mouth going, and all that kind of stuff. But she made a comment that I thought was so beautiful about this piece and the diversity of her awards was, it's very classic, right? We, we know that. And she said, there's this romanticism, but it's not sweet. And that really hung with me, right? So for a whole day, I thought about that. And I thought, that's tricky to pull off, right? Because I was told by a mentor once, 
Be careful of Candyland, Richard. You're very close to painting. <laughs> Which means very sweet, you know, it's like more color and more of this, and I'll put more frosting on the cake and sprinkles on top of it, everything, because it's fun, right? To the point where at times, joking with this artist, I said, I think I'm probably a diabetic artist. <laughs> I need a shot of insulin at a point. So I usually have to take some of the sprinkles off. And I, I think b beyond the capability in the technique, the use of edge, lost and found edges. I mean, I could go on and on about the classicism in this piece, the focal points that the eye goes to. But to pull off that tricky thing of, it's not a cliche. In a way, the subject matter is, but the painting's not, see? Think of the challenge of that. It could be romantic and sweet, but it isn't. And that's what I think really elevated this piece. I was misunderstood in your time. You, you've got to remind yourself of that, about it. So, you know, people can look at it and they go, I don't understand what this artist is doing. Yeah. I can tell it's a tree and a field and some water, but what's going on here? And this artist reminds me, and you may know this artist's name from history, Charles Birchfield, um, again, a regionalist. But Charles Birchfield ended up painting, he loved storms, and he would paint trees, love trees. And you see this expression in the trees, and the trees would bend. And his son, they did a documentary about Charles Birchfield. His paintings now are museum quality and go for a fortune. But he said, he said, our dad would, whenever a storm was coming, he'd grab my brother and I's hand and we would stand out front in the storm. And he said, we'd say, oh God, dad, we're getting wet and the wind's blowing. He said, he said, just watch, watch what's here. Now what is that message is how we need to slow down as technicians at times. Instead of going, oh, I'm doing my underpainting and now I'm doing this stuff. Just be present with what's there. Take that in. And that becomes part of that internal memory and that internal emotion. And when the son was talking about it, he said, we did it over and over again. We never understood as little kids. And he said, I look at my dad's paintings now and I know how passionate he was about trying to convey the energy that was happening in those trees. So they're not hyper-realistic bed trees. He's showing force and emotion and this profound beauty in what is a dramatic storm that is threatening. And I think this artist just has it. To make a choice with leaves like this, to show this almost feminine, sensual form and motion to them, right? Thomas Hart Benton is, was a regionalist also. And uh, there's something magical about that, very creative, very creative. Um, it shows Sorry. an out-of-focus background the way really a camera sees. There's nothing wrong with that. Right? I use photography. We all, photography is a magnificent tool. My advice to you is look at photography as never being a guilt thing. Um, like uh, William Truman Hosner bought his books, recommend you do. He, he is the purest plein air painter I've ever met in my life, and it comes right from his heart. He doesn't do anything from photography. I'm not that guy. I love being out there. But photography calms me when I'm out there working. So I can take a dozen photographs, and I say, well, I got photographs, I can look at them later. I'm taking the scene in and working with it. And like Edgar Payne, the magnificent California Impressionist School, the legend of that, use it. We now know through history that Renoir, Monet even, they all used it. But these were people that knew how to use it and not abuse it, right? <laughs> so I know this because this is how the camera focuses in a depth. The human eye, if I'm looking at you, everything here and here is out of focus. Mm -hmm. And we focus on spots and move. Mm -hmm. So there's a tool. This is my thing. I have a guess, and I'm pretty darn sure, there's nobody here born before photography. <laughs> it's a pretty good one. I think I might win that, that guess. The point being, when you realize that I've been influenced by it, you've been influenced by it, 
we can't not be influenced by it. So it colors how we see, it colors how the world sees, right? You've all heard it. Your painting's as good as a photograph. Yeah. They mean it as a compliment. Honestly, own that. They mean it as a compliment. Because to them, that's the pinnacle. Do you know what the response is, kindly? You yeah. say, I like to think it's better than a photograph. <laughs> so this um, highly educated, her in London, has a great art background, very cultural in Egypt. She embraces her culture. It's beautiful. There's, at times, we can lose that identity, right? It's almost, we want to belong, so it's hammered out of us. And everybody ends up painting a little bit the same. You know, I can go to China and I'm looking at paintings that look like Monet did them. Well, that's great, it's a beautiful painting, but I'm in China. And what I love about Hala's work, and she brings this wonderful abstract quality, is it's the patterns, the colors, the textures, the tones of Egypt. It was her, it's her culture, it's her heritage. It's around her every day, and it's expressed in her work. So I think that's, I feel this way. Now, why am I mentioning that to all of you? Because I can do these gallery tours and pick on framing and tell you, in my unhumble opinion, why it shouldn't be framed this way or framed this way. But this artist is using the presentation. So I mentioned this once many years ago after judging, and an artist came up and they said, you know, I'm a little offended because frame shouldn't be considered. And I said, you know what? When you met me, I'm clothed. <laughs> you know, if I'm going to show up, and this is maybe dated now and archaic, but to say if I'm applying for an important job, I'm not going to show up in my dirty t-shirt that I work in the yard in. Now, I might be brilliant, but I said we do judge by appearance. So be aware of that in your framing. Overframe can hurt you, underframe, and this artist is using it creatively as part of their design and beautifully. So exciting and yet mysterious to us. We don't work this way a lot. But you know, again, a culture in kind of Finland and some of these places, very expressionistic. Okay? You know, munch, imagery. I don't completely understand what's here. You can read this beautiful statement, but you make out this figure in these kind of wings coming from it. There's a statement in here. And I haven't quite solved the mystery completely, <laughs> but I'm so excited by it. And then the weight and the grass, I know everything, this is what I know. It's purposeful, it's expressing something, and I'm gonna figure it out eventually. <laughs> Earth tone, right? So we get back to this color thing. Great statement. Go, the quality of color has nothing to do with the quantity of color. Now, that's not meant at any of you that express with great color. Mm -hmm. But don't forget, the color's not gonna solve anything. So the quantity has nothing to do with the quality in a painting. Mm -hmm. And because we do frame them, we think, oh, I should make that blue bluer, and this, this, and this, and I go, what you present to your audience the mind takes that frame, and that is blue, the bluest blue, that is the warmest warm, or the reddest red, and it's a great experiment to work in that little bit lower key a bit, that, sometimes that key of, of uh, Corot, you know, and experiment with it, and you'll feel like, oh, I'm producing a more muted painting and stuff, but then when you frame it, that window, what is in front of you is presented to you. The same thing happens with value, yeah. a high key painting. There's absolutely nothing in here that reaches black, or even value one on a scale of zero to 10. But we associate that dark because we see that light, and it's all we're given. So if you walked away and I didn't tell you that, and I said, sorry, there's some really strong darks in there. Oh yeah, there are strong darks. In there. And then you can look at something else, don't have a good example here in front of me, but you look at something else where the artist is, like Terry Ford, God, I love her work. <laughs> you know, I just love Terry Ford's work, and she's this tiny little 
you know, wonderful artists and I'm this big, I paint delicately and in that close range and Terry's all about drama. Get those darks darker, bolder, vibrant. You know, it works in her work, it doesn't work in my hand. Magical piece, classic paper. That's another one of the things I think as pastelists, we got so excited to have sandpapers, love them, work on them all the time. We get into making our own surfaces, do the same thing, make them, use them, love them. And when I see work of this quality, draftsmanship, gorgeous composition, and then you also read what's in here, but don't read it first. <laughs> Ask yourself, what is the artist conveying in this portrait of this older woman? How is it making me feel? What, what do I see coming across in this? And then read this statement and, and see if the artist has accomplished their goal. Uh, and again, we're familiar with the work. We may not have met the artist yet or visited with them. Is the artist has found a series, a purpose, right? We, the medical thing, the pandemic, the mask even outside. The, this is going to become a series that will signify in that visual way, what we've all been going through. And other artists can do it even in an abstract way of conveying the emotion of what we've all gone through and how joyous it's been to be back with our tribe. What a classic. There's so much quietness in this piece. And when you stand with it intimately, what I wanted to posit this piece for sure is there's such mastery in delicacy. You know, musicians know that. You know, again, I can be loud and dramatic, and some artists are meant to be that. You've got to let that voice out. But there's also so much mastery in pulling off subtlety in a painting. You artists meant to work like this artist. This artist typically works more small is so sensitive to their landscape where they live there. You can look at this piece and you know this person has an intimate relationship with what's there. There's no drama, no black blacks, light lights, bold colors, but you start looking at it and within almost the mundaneness of it, you find this beauty. And one of my first challenges for myself in landscape was to find the beauty in the mundane. And I went into one of the ugliest parts of Oregon in the high desert, just really brutal. Most people drive as fast as they can across that area. And I said, I'm gonna spend a week here every day, just submerge myself in this sterile landscape. And the first couple of days were hard because we looked for subject matter, right? We looked for the waterfall or the great color or the beautiful shaped tree and things. Those things are lovely, I love them. But the longer I kept looking, I became fascinated by that quiet intimacy of the texture, the texture design, the soil, the rhythm, the movement, the quietness at times, that sterility, and it became a challenge. You know, how do you take this thing that most people would never stop and look at? And here's what I found noble. The artist makes their audience, right, smell, stop and smell the roses. They're so busy that most people that walk right by that if they were out there with you on a, on a walk, but because it's a painting, they pause. And when they pause and look at it, they get that gift of being reminded of everything that's around us. And that's who you are. The greatest gift as an artist for me is not that I may sell some paintings, uh, end up with a painting in a museum, or you know, write a book, and that, that, that's nice stuff. But it's the ability to communicate with somebody else, to make them pause, and I can be dead and gone. And you say, I hope somebody sits and looks at that and enjoys it. So hold on to that, you guys. It isn't all about, I got in the show, I won a ribbon or anything. It's that human connection. Um, I really think that's important. Who knows how to draw, they know everything about edges, color, value. 
great placement, the reflection in the glasses, you know, the story starts to get, to get told. We see the people in the activity, again, the use of space. Look at that composition. You know, all I'm sharing with you is it's like I peel this open and what's the thought <laughs> process is coming out the mouth. I look at this and I went, I had to probably finish the hat and done this, and I'm going, look at that. So when you go to a museum, or you go to a show like this, or you buy an art book or a magazine comic, when you look at the work, ask yourself a very simple question I've challenged every student to do. If that was on my easel, how would I feel? <coughs> and that's what I'm telling you here is I go, Richard, you'd have probably been more classic about it, but look what you would have lost. So in the moment you go, oh, I won't remember that. This process that I'm going through, I won't remember it. But it becomes internal. And even years down the road, when you're painting, all of a sudden you'll go, I'm gonna do this. Or I'm gonna use that color. And somebody will go, why, why did you choose that color? And you go, I'm not really sure. <laughs> But something is telling me I should. And that something isn't something you're born with. I firmly believe this. It isn't some, oh, they were anointed. It's you seen or been exposed to something. And it went internal, not up here. So the reasoning part, the why, I go, I can tell you why I want to pick up that fuchsia and put a mark in that green forest. Mm -hmm. And the person goes, I don't know. I said, let's see what happens. The permission comes from what you're seeing around you in this show. So you always paint better. Sunsets and sunrises, hardest thing to paint because back to my comment about sweet, I've never been able to pull it off. I paint a sunset, looks like a postcard. Paint a sunrise, looks like a postcard. But an artist that can pull it off, I think is, that's pretty special. Love the mark making, Marla. Uh, I mean, you know, She's a legend. We, we all know and love her work. Uh, you know, beautiful light. Uh, I love what Glenn does with his work. He's another one I, I go, I, I saw his work now, oh, wow, it's almost becoming many years ago at PSA for the first time. And at that time, it, it, there was something so fresh and different about it. You know, we see people at, at the beach, we see uh, swimmers doing things, we see these things. and. When you first see that, it's like the the, fig, the bodies underwater. Right? The first time you go, ooh, how different, how interesting. If we're not careful, again, it becomes a little predictable. But what I've noticed in Glenn, that's why I, I really stopped at this piece this time, he's still reaching, you know, and he goes back to that subject matter. He goes back to the beach and the children, and whether they're grandchildren or his children, or the people in the area, we feel this connection to this, especially to me, a Southern California type of scene. Fabulous composition, weight, counterbalance, movement, right? Every painting has to have an entryway. We enter. We enter a book, right? As Westerners, we start up here, we end here. Portraiture, that works well. You can enter up here in a portrait or a still life because it's intimate like a book. But a landscape, always will enter at the bottom. I didn't say it's center of interest or the most interesting part, but it's our only relationship to what's in front of us as a human is to enter it. Even if I'm looking at you, I'm walking across to you, see? That internal feeling about any landscape is important to us when we're painting because we have to allow that entry, emotion, into our painting. And uh, this, I'm a big ascent, you know, counterbalance, movement, talk to students just like the body. You know, if I go like this, the arm's gotta go like that. Because if I try to go like this, I'm gonna fall over, which at the, my age and what I'm going through, I fall over now all the time. But look at this, in, you're held, you move up. Even the use of the pink and violet, you come back over here, you come back down. <laughs> oh, so he has their personal feelings about what they see. Certain things grab us. We're excited about certain things throughout our artistic journey. And so they pop up to us, become more aware of something, we learn something. But 
look at a show and don't do it in a negative saying, I don't know why they picked that. I don't know why that won an award. Go up and be curious about it. Judge saw some merit in it. But I was so thrilled to see this piece grabbed me the minute I walked in. You know, I, I can see this artist that just let themselves into the vines and the flowers, the permission to let these marks, where, where if I just isolated that, it's pure abstract. It just, it's magical. You know, it's just magic. I mean, it, such a beautiful color harmony to it. Um, so that's always rewarding. You know, if you cruise a show before you know what the award winners are, you're, you're going to get that, hmm, maybe I had a pretty good inclination because uh, she recognized that piece. And these are beautiful. This piece, Jay-Z is one of my favorite artists. Uh, I love what he does with figures. Um, you know, he has an Asian background, living in Texas, physician. He expresses, he is such an expressionist in his figurative work. And I hadn't seen that many landscapes until recently. And, uh, you know, this Chinese village, uh, fortunate to have been to China a couple times and kind of see this uh, deep in the woods. It is painfully abstract, beautiful use of the paper and pastel technique. This is not on a sanded surface. And why I, I've mentioned that a couple times, and as I said, I'm, I'm really a sanded surface painter. I can paint on hard kit paper. But when the sand, when Wallace and you are, you are amazing, you know, all these papers come along, we got so excited because we always had hard kit paper to deal with that we kind of abandoned it for a while. And I'm seeing this trend, even in this show, if you walk around and look, you're seeing more and more artists utilizing those traditional surfaces. And the pendulum is swinging, and yet the work is very expressive. Wow. Wow. You know, I mean, if, if you know Corey's work, he, classic realism. You know, it's very painterly in the fashion of paint. Uh, his work isn't photographic, and yet it's hyper-realistic in the sense of it's the way the human sees. It's the essence of when I look at you or I look at you. And he's able to convey that with the best of them. Again, the Richard Schmids, the people. Sadly, I just heard we lost Harvey Dinnerstein on Tuesday, uh, you know, who was one of my heroes growing up, and they're falling. So, you know, build your archives of these people's work. Beautiful classic use of the gray paper. But I've seen now like four self-portraits. And I, any of you that were figurative or portrait artist-wise, the more you give yourself permission to get into those self-portraits, something starts to happen in your work. We saw it with Rembrandt. You have no better model that you know if you allow yourself to not be the phony. And I, I, I wish he was here so I could say this to him. He's given himself permission that you feel like you know him and you know something about him, it's not just a pretty portrait of a person that has a likeness. The likeness is in the personality and the soul of what's there. So you could say, you, you said you started with portraiture, why'd you quit? I hated commissions because people want to be flattered. They want to be pleased. You aren't gonna get paid if you don't please the client. And I hated that, it took me a while to figure out but I figured it out on the day when I desperately hoped the client would die, so I didn't. <laughs> and, I and I thought, I, I thought this is not a good field for me to be in. You know, I'm avoiding them. I'm not answering the phone. I'm just wishing they'd go away. And I thought I can't paint to please like that. So I'm a. I really encourage any of you, meet your clients' needs. Do what you need to do to put bread and butter on the table. But give yourself, if you're a portrait figurative artist, permission to do self-portraits. Putting the texture in Paul Murray's piece and permission. Aileen's light. I mean, Aileen to me is like the perfect definition of an impressionist. 
you know, it's all about that halcyon feeling of light. And uh, anyway, huge fan of Marsha, Barbara Janicki. Oh my God. Snow, not the easiest thing to paint <laughs> because it can either look really plastic um, or we can go too far in pushing the color. And that's where I always got in trouble. The snow became too pink, too blue, a little too much green. I always avoided yellow snow. <laughs> All this piece. So I, I do want to end over here. And I, I'm going to be concluding here with just an encouragement to all of you because it's what I have to remind myself about continuing our artistic journey, pushing ourselves. Working in various mediums for a time and then coming back to pastel, you actually become a better painter because you start to learn that the secret is not that I'm using pastel. I'm actually producing a painting and I can use any medium. Margaret Moyer, my mentor, looked at me one day and it's a long story so I won't go into it, but it was an artist that didn't have the tool they needed to finish her painting. And she looked at me and she said, Richard, I want you to remember this. If you don't have a brush, you should be able to paint the painting with a popsicle stick. Because the brush isn't the secret to the good painting. And that that and, and Andrew's really going somewhere with his street scenes and what he's brought to it and his figurative work recently. Just so exciting. Uh, Lynn's work, uh, I think especially going back to Maine, we've seen, if you know her work in the years now that she's moved back to that area. Not that her work wasn't beautiful before it was, but I think her soul is more here. Uh, this little gray portrait by Michelle Ashby from, uh, there are paintings, I think Wyeth is a bit like this for me, where the imagery, what their subject matter is, what they choose to use in that, how they position it, moves us, stops us, right? You know, you, you think of Wyeth's Christina's world or the window with the curtain. And Michelle making a choice here, uh, the, you know, slightly aging, beautiful woman, the position of the hand, the looking up, but yet the eyes closed, and then to choose to only do it in black and white. And it was so intriguing. Now, she's obviously could do anything she wants with pastel, but it's not the mark making. It's not the bold use of color. Those things are glorious in somebody else's hand. But it's the image that you stop and pause and then having the ability to read the artist's purpose, you start connecting the dots. So I encourage you to take a moment and read that, is who she is. There's great work here. I, I love what Brian does in his expression, Tatiana's, uh, Laura's beautiful use of color and abstraction and luminosity in her work, uh, Sandra Bachel from New Orleans. But, and this is not about arguing with the judge, Cole, that's one of my favorites. I love her work. I love working <laughs> with her. We're curating more shows. You guys have heard us in the prospectuses talking about that. And I was fortunate to work with her last year around this and, and several artists this year. And it's so nice to sit down and have a conversation like, what do you see in this piece? And they start explaining these things like I'm doing. It opens up a veil for you. This would have been my pre of show. Okay. And I think it, it, for some artists, it's a piece that they're maybe not that comfortable with that much atmosphere or that, again, what I call tonalism quality. And I adore her work, and I know her work, and I've been appreciating it and kind of, uh, kind of peeking to see you know, where she's going and what she's doing with great admiration. But wow, stuff like this just kills me. I mean, I, I went, this is color space painting meets simultaneous contrast meets luminosity in this, these landscapes I'm talking. I guess maybe as I'm aging and dealing with crises in life, I, this kind of peacefulness, right? You know, that Midwestern peacefulness. And um, that's all I can say. I, I, I just adore this piece.
Now, now I'm going to make her laugh. I, I almost tried to make a way to say, I will sponsor an award. You preach a certificate. Because I want everybody, I'm just encouraging, I'm not saying call it. I want you to love this piece because it's different. And look what pastel can do. You've seen it on display. You've seen multiple voices creatively expressed. But who would have thought 20 years ago that you could look at a painting like this and say, that's pastel, and it's pastel. So go enjoy. Have a great time. Thank you. And by 1974, it had started growing, and pastel artists all over America were calling Flora at home saying, I live in, Pens I live in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I live in Des Moines, Iowa. I want to open a branch of Pastel Society of America here in Iowa. And Flora always said, no, you should start your own society for your neighbors and your friends. I will help you do that. So within a few years, there was something like 30 regional pastel societies. Meanwhile, Flora is in New York. Urena is in California. Urena comes up with this concept of a larger umbrella that gather, or a larger tent that gathers all societies together so that they can share the mutual benefits of being a larger group, and flies to New York to seek Flora's approval, which was given. And PSA was, is a founding member of IAPS. Oh. Human nature took over, petty jealousies took over, rivalries took over. I told you it's a family. <laughs> <laughs> you love my sister more than me, and someone from PSA went home unhappy and found a board that was receptive to, we should be number one, uh, we should get all the glory, etc. And PSA withdrew from IAPS. Mm -hmm. And then I don't remember how many years, but they made the mistake of inviting me to be a board <laughs> member. <laughs> and I was very aware of IAPS. I was already a friend of Urena. I had passed all the tests that Flora could give me, and I was often a dinner guest. And my response was, but everyone in IAPS is also a PSA member. Why would you do that to your own membership? And so then we started within the board shifting the whole attitude until we had the majority, and we rejoined PSA, thanks to the great efforts and diplomacy of Dwayne Wakeham and board member, IAPS board member Ray Smith, and we have been an enthusiastic, full partner with IAPS ever since, and that would have been 2006 or something like that. I don't together. <laughs> Thank you for, I'm glad I asked a question. <laughs> and you know, what kind of question I can ask him? And, I, I <laughs> and if you want the nitty gritty, we can meet over here and I'll tell you the details. <laughs> so yes, I'd love to know. We, we, we have time yeah. limitation. He knows where all the pastel bodies are. <laughs> <laughs> but the important thing is we all have a common interest. Uh, we live in a changing world, and we are here for our own mutual good and fellowship, 
and there's this beautiful show here, and it's really, uh, for me, this is the first trip I've made in two years, so it's really a moment of celebration for all of us, and hopefully two years from now, uh, in terms of international health, we will all be in an even healthier, safer space Touch is affected, I think, in, in pastel more than almost any other medium. We can have oil, we can have uh, different surfaces. Watercolors can have different surfaces. And of course, that's going to affect the flow, as is the brand of paint, the amount of water. But in pastel, we're so tactile. Everything's tactile. N no other medium are we getting the sensation from our hand. So when we pick up the stick and we hold the stick, let's something bright here that'll show up. Plus, these sticks have not been broken in, so we might get some really interesting marks here by doing that. Don't break my by stick! <laughs> well, those are pretty good it. So, I, I personally, I'll just get personal, I love to hold this stick between my three fingers. Uh, I feel it, and I can feel the sensation of the paper coming up through the stick and into my hand. And we respond in a tactile way of we're using our eyes, the mind is processing what we're seeing, we're seeing it interacting with the surface. So surface plays a huge part. The consistency and the substance of the stick. So Sennelier is known, legendary, and in a way one of the most legendary pastel brands on earth, as having this beautiful fluid quality. The other French stick, that he brought over is Giraud. And Giraud can do a little bit of both. So I can make a mark, and even if I'm a bit quiet, you can hear that sound versus that sound. One is the same intensity of pigment coming off, but it takes a little more pressure, a little bit more of that tactile push to get the pigment to come down to achieve the same look. And harder sticks even, I'm going to break one of your beautiful oh. <laughs> You can now go to their booth, and because I've touched this, <laughs> there will be a special price. <laughs> so again, holding it the same way, I'll talk about some mark making, but the same amount of pressure, same sound, and so I'm not getting that intensity, and this I had to press lighter with. Now, Pierre was talking about painting and drawing. And my philosophy is very similar. I understand, you know, why 
for societal reasons, we want to elevate pastel to painting because really our marketplace has elevated painting above drawing. Technically, pastel is drawing. A stick in your hand making a mark. Even this big swipe is a mark. Of course, I can tip it up and make that side. I can make a line with it, and I can use the tip to make a dot. So a very versatile. If, if I was thinking of this as painting, I have four brushes in my hand at any given time. I also have the ability with tactile pressure, if it was paint, to say more medium in the paint or less medium in the paint. So in those terms, pastel is really similar to painting. We can apply it uh, a bit like a palette knife or like a brush, so we can put it on its side, use a little softer stick than a harder stick. If I start with that stick, I start doing that, I can start turning it, but I can also let it become what James McNeil Whistler, the legendary expatriate American citizen who spent all of his life basically in London, but when he, long story of history, decides to go to Venice for a while, he lost a lawsuit of, from a client, and he went there to really create a group of prints. He is a printmaker also. And he took pastel to sketch with. And he did the most exquisite, small pastels. And he coined the phrase that pastel can be like the breath of the air from a butterfly. It can also be as mighty and as strong as the greatest stroke of thick paint from the brush of Monet. So there's something really beautiful about that. Again, the tactileness of it, the quality of making strokes. I could, I could stand here for your whole hour and talk about layering pastels. Again, hatching, very, very famous technique of mark making in a direction. You can change the direction, layer something else. In pastel, we often utilize the surface to come back through. In this case, you get that beautiful vibration of the yellow and can use simultaneous contrast. So I can work with that yellow. I can work with the value. Uh, in this case, everything I've used is darker, unless I choose to go to something lighter, which will really change the appearance here. The minute something lighter is added, the paper now becomes a mid-tone. So we are working, because we're working with color and pigment, in the philosophy of painting. But we can also be the draftsman. We can see, I think pastel, and I do love it, so I probably maybe exaggerate this a bit. I think we have a capacity that we don't find in the other mediums that I do love. The oil painter has a harder time with the mark making or the hatching and that, that, that quality in their work. Um, and we can run the gamut from that delicacy to the strength to the mark making, to the motion. And so, in my unhumble opinion, <laughs> it's the most diverse of some of the fine art mediums, and it's been so exciting, like they were talking about, to see pastel now develop from a more classical sense of realism, which is beautiful, into more contemporary uses, innovative uses. And I'm gonna conclude in just saying the mixed media uses. You know, for oil to be archival, you have to work within the system of oil. Otherwise, it's going to fall apart. Watercolor is the same way, acrylic the same way. But in pastel, all we need is a surface. My earliest teacher just said, you need a substrate that has enough texture to hold pigment. You need good pigment of quality and strength. So never downgrade. You're teaching yourself to paint with something. You can see how strong the pigments of Sennelli is. They're magnificent. Their darks were the most legendary of the darks, the darkest of the darks when they came out. <laughs> the dark side, the dark side. You paying me? No? Okay. Well, you know I love Sennelier from day one and visiting the store in Paris, like even Terry was talking about, you stand at the edge of the Louvre and you look across the Seine and you see Sennelier, you know, and uh, anyway, a whole other story. 
But I do believe in that diversity, and I just encourage if, you, if people have never played with pastel and experimented with it, I was in conversation today with a lovely lady that was talking about doing a paint around. You know, we always had the IF's fun event of five artists working on the same painting, and she said she took that home and decided to have five artists of different mediums switch, and they had never worked on the other yeah. medium, and she said they were all excited, but more excited about the pastel. They didn't never touch it. They had no idea. So, so I want to add a couple of things to what you said, if you don't mind. Correct my <coughs> history. No, okay. To add to it. So oil paint, in particular, not only if you don't use the right recipe, it could be challenging for the conservation of it. But even if you do follow all the rules, you still have to restore it every 50 or 100 years because the varnish has to be removed. Pastels, literally, if you haven't yet seen those, he was referring to the 18th century pastel from France. You go to the one I know the most, it's at the Met, or, or it's at the Louvre, but at the Met, they have a whole section of the portraits from the 18th century, even late 17th century. They were never been restored. I know because I'm a good friend who's the head of the conservation department. It's like they were painted yesterday, and they are three or four hundred years old. Yeah. So you don't need, so even following the oil technique, you still need to restore. Pastel, as long as you don't break them or put in a direct light for hours, it's forever. See, the, for the fragileness you're describing in pastel early on, where those issues came up, was more about paper, the substrate, and artists not understanding the world, not understanding at that time, uh, the problems with pH balance and uh, is it 100% reg. And then the one thing, too, in reference to those historic paintings is at that time all the pigments, in a way, were much more similar to the cave. They were true earth tones, yep. you know, and rising up and then in through the cadmiums, very stable. And the, the only thing across the board in, in pigments is are some of the dyes. You know, we have to make sure that we are using good brands that are dealing with that. And otherwise, you're absolutely dead on. Those, that, and the Quentin de la Tour, right yep. there in your home state now, when you're home, not France, you're home. Yep. Uh, yeah. Largest pastel figure portrait painting on earth. You walk into the Getty up there. It's as big as a wall. Brilliant, beautiful, magnificent, and huge. And like you said, nobody's cleaning the varnish off, worrying about it hammering and stuff. So as long as the surface is good, the pigments are good, the artist has some talent and quality, <laughs> you're going to have a piece that will survive those. Or hundreds, Quentin de la Tour, two, three hundred years old. So, Thank it's you. a rich history, and it's based in France. <laughs> We're making it our own, though. We're working with them around. So, uh, thank you. Thank you, Richard. Thank you, all of you.